Thank you all so much. Turn in your copy of the Word of God to Matthew chapter 23. I'm going to read to you the last three verses today. Matthew's Gospel chapter 23. I'll begin at verse 37 here in just a few moments. I am preaching to you today message number four in this five-part series based on Isaiah 9, 6. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And today we have come to Everlasting Father. This one, if we're not careful, can confuse us just a little bit, especially those of us who believe Orthodox, Trinitarian theology. What I mean by that is that we believe, as the Scripture says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we know our God is one. Uh, those who study religion would say we are monotheistic. We have one God, but our God, the Christian God, the only God, expresses Himself eternally, exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when we see here in the passage today that Jesus is called the Everlasting Father, is Isaiah trying to say that Messiah, that Christ, is the Heavenly Father? No, the answer to that question is emphatically no. The church years ago, centuries ago, settled that question. The idea that God could only exist as Father at times, but then as Jesus at times, and then as the Holy Spirit at other times, that's an old heresy called modalism. It's not true. The Bible says that our God, the only God, exists eternally as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So then, Isaiah did not say here, did not attribute the name Heavenly Father to Messiah. He attributed to, to him the name Everlasting Father in the sense that Jesus is the Father of our faith. The Bible says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. In the same sense that George Washington is seen as being a founding father of the United States of America, Jesus Christ certainly himself through His death, burial, and resurrection, is the Father and the founder of our faith. What I want us to do today is to look here in Matthew's Gospel to see specifically how it is that Jesus Christ acts towards us as a loving, everlasting Father. I want to invite you to stand to your feet, if you will, in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Matthew chapter 23 the last three verses, I'm going to begin at verse 37. If you found it and you're glad you came today, say amen. amen. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you so much and be seated. Several things I want to say to you about this fatherly nature of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the few moments we have left together here today. Number one, let me say to you that Jesus exemplifies a father's love. Jesus exemplifies a father's love. You heard it there in the voice of Jesus. The context is he's standing out on the hillside in Jerusalem. He's looking out over the city and he cries out and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And you can hear the love in his voice. Jesus, when He came to this earth, He came to save the lost house of Israel. In fact, He told His disciples at the beginning of their ministry, don't go into the way of the Gentiles, but rather go to the sheep and the, the lost sheep in the house of Israel. And so they did. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation for every person that believes, for the Jew first, then for the Greek, the Gentile. See, it was God's plan all along to reveal His salvation initially to His people, the Jewish people, because God loves His people. In fact, God loves all the world. 
If you are blessed with a wonderful earthly father, an earthly dad, like I was, then you probably learned from his example that there were times that he would work long hours and he would make lots of sacrifices. Well, why would an earthly dad do that? Because he loves his wife and he loves his children and he wants nothing but the best for their welfare. Dads love their kids if they're good dads. And in the same fashion, our Lord Jesus Christ loves us and He desires all men to be saved. He desires Jewish people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. He desires Gentiles like us to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And our God is most glorified through the salvation of those who call upon the name of Jesus. And once you and I have trusted in Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Aren't you glad today that Jesus loves you and He loves me just as a father loves His children? Number two, not only does Jesus exemplify a father's love, but He demonstrates a father's patience. He demonstrates the Father's patience. Look at verse 37 one more time. He cries out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. Think about what the Jewish people did. God would deliver them and take them out of bondage and take them out of captivity and He brought them to the land and He blessed them abundantly with manna in the wilderness and water out of the rock and over and over again He would deliver His people and bless them and what would they do? They would take unto themselves ungodly kings and ungodly rulers and the priests would become ungodly and unholy and they would go after pagan wicked gods, made up religions, God says that His people would play the harlot with other, with other gods and other ways. So God loved His people and desired for His people to be saved. But over and over again, they would decide that they would not want God. But rather they would desire to do it another way. Obviously testing the, the patience and the long-suffering nature of our God. Do you have children? Do you have grandchildren sometimes who maybe test your patience? Remember what it was like when you were a child and you tested the patience of your father and your mother. Maybe when you took your dad's car out when he said not to and you wrecked it. Or maybe when you refused to follow his clear instruction and direction or when your mom and dad chided you and told you Apply yourself to your homework and be diligent and make good grades. And instead you went out and did the opposite. I'd say all of us would be guilty of trying the patience of our parents. Of our fathers in particular to this passage along the way. What we see up there here in the text though is that God kept His covenant with the Jews even though they killed the prophets. I mean, when they were sinning and, and worshiping pagan gods, God would send them prophets to say what you're doing is wrong. We need to come back to God and repent of our sins. And instead of listening to the prophets over and over again, they would persecute them and even slaughter them. And so what did God do? Do you know that from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New and the Gospels, there was about a 400 year period, biblically, scripturally, of silence? You know how sometimes maybe you try to tell a child or a friend or a coworker or a classmate that they need to listen to something, they need to do something, and you tell them over and over again, and it just seems like they've stopped listening to you? And so sometimes what do we have to do? Just stop talking and step back. And say, God, I've tried to show them. Now, Lord, I'm asking you to show them. And so what did God do? God just stepped back and he stopped talking to them for a little while. Until finally, some angels burst on the scene in a field that was reserved for shepherds back in the day and said, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy that shall be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
And what great joy that brought, not only to those of that day, but what great joy that brings to us as well. See, that's how patient God is. That despite the wickedness and the sinfulness of Israel, He would continue to love and to bless them. Listen, God doesn't make excuses for our sin. There is no justification for our sin. We sin willfully against God, the Bible says in James chapter 1. But God knows we are sinners. And He loves us despite our sin. And aren't you thankful today that God is merciful and patient with us? If He wasn't, where would we be? We would be in hell. That's where we would be. But God is gracious And God is merciful, and that's why all of us are here today. Thanks be to God. He knows the Father's patience. Number three, Jesus understands a father's pain. Jesus understands a father's pain. Look at verse 37 one more time. He says, you've stoned the prophets, you've killed the prophets. How often? I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. I would have saved you. I would have delivered you. I would have blessed you. I would have forgiven your sins. But he says to his people, Israel, you wouldn't do it. See, here's the reality today. God loves everybody and God desires to save everybody. But hear me well when I tell you this morning, God has never, will never force anyone to be saved. He's provided an atonement for our sins. He's told us clearly in the Word of God what it takes to be saved. He's given us the Lord Jesus Christ and said, all you must do is give control of your life over to the Lord by placing your faith in Christ. And if you'll do that, you'll be born again. He's told us all that emphatically. He's proven the veracity of the Bible over and over again. We know it. But God's not going to force us to receive it. We, when we come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, must receive the truth for ourselves and willingly give our lives to Christ. You have the opportunity to do that here today if you have never done that. But sadly... You know, the Bible says that Jesus came to His own people and that they received Him not. Can you imagine? Have you ever been rejected before? Have you ever been rejected by the people that you love the most? That's painful. And fathers, mothers down here on this earth have experienced that very thing, sometimes even rejected by their own children. I had, a, I had a dear lady who came to me after the early service and I preached on this and she said, Pastor, I want you to pray with me because I don't think I'm welcome at my children's house this Christmas. She's hurt because she's been rejected by her own. Our moms and dads down here on the earth understand these things. The scripture says, you know what? They have told us over and over again, here's the right thing to do, here's the wrong thing to do, and sometimes we exercise our freedom to go out and do the very thing they told us not to do. And when a father or a mother sits back and watches a child make critical mistakes and bad decisions like that, their heart breaks because they know that child could place his or herself in a very terrible place. Not only do our sins bring harm to us, I want you to understand that our sins grieve the Lord. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, that you and I ought not to grieve the Holy Spirit that God has placed within us. Do we realize today that Jesus, when He visited the tomb of Lazarus, The shortest verse in the Bible, if you're looking to start a Bible memory plan for 2024, start with this one. John 11, 35 says, Jesus wept. Two words. You can say, man, I got that one memorized already in the new year. One verse of Scripture. John 11, 35. Jesus wept. Well, why did Jesus weep? Did He weep because Lazarus was dead? Well, that may have had something to do with it. Lazarus was His friend, but He knew because He's completely and fully God, He knows all things and has all power held in His hand. He knew that He was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. 
So it doesn't really make sense for the death of Lazarus alone to be the reason for Christ weeping. The reason I think Christ wept outside the tomb of Lazarus is because he saw firsthand what the curse of sin has done to the human race. Not only had a man been buried for four days, his dear friend, but look at all the people weeping outside the tomb. Listen to Martha. Listen to Mary and the pain in their voice and all the people standing outside the tomb. And when Christ looked on that in His humanity, He was broken and He wept with us. Our sin brings grief to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Now, thanks be to God, it doesn't change the fact that God is all-powerful. Doesn't change the fact He knows all things. Doesn't change the fact that He's completely and fully God. But God grieves with our sin. Jesus Himself in His humanity knew what it was like to feel the pain of a father, of a mother who wants the best for his child or her child. But then the child goes and chooses something else. God knows. Number four. Jesus teaches a father's lesson. Not only does he understand a father's pain, but he teaches a father's lesson. Look at verse 38 one more time. He says one word, see. In other words, stop, look, think. Watch what I'm about to tell you right now. See this. Your house is left to you desolate. That's a very hard lesson that Jesus had to teach his fellow Jews. You see, because of the fact that they had rejected the prophets and they had gone after other gods and they had not been faithful to the Lord and they desired a human king when God was their king, the culmination of all of that is that Israel and Jerusalem in some ways became like a spiritual wasteland. Now they still had the worship and they still had the sacrifice and they had their traditions and there were still some good things happening there, but in a lot of ways there was a spiritual desolation that had set in. They were not walking in the fullness of God intended for them to have a spiritual desolation, which, by the way, turned into an actual desolation. About 40 years after the words that I'm reading to you today, guess what happened in about the year 67 A.D.? The temple in Jerusalem was totally destroyed by the Romans. If you go to Israel with me, one of these days when the travel opens up and we get to go again, if you go to Israel with me, you know what you can find when you stand there at the base, at the foundation of the Temple Mount? There are still large stones that were originally hewn out of rock, brought to the Temple Mount, used to construct the temple. There are still large stones at the base of the Temple Mount that the Romans pushed over the edge of the foundation and they're still laying down there at the bottom as an everlasting memorial to all of us that if you decide you don't want to do things my way, there is a consequence for that decision. And so Jesus says to them, Because this is the path that you've chosen. This is what you're going to have to deal with. Did your mom and dad ever have to have that kind of conversation with you before? I hate to say I told you, but... I told you. I told you this would be the effect of your decision. But you know what? Our parents correct us like that. They rebuke us like that lovingly from time to time. The reason they do that is not because they hate us. It's because they love us. Good moms and dads love their kids and want them to come to maturity in Christ and to honor the Word of God. And by the way, if you have trusted in Jesus, you are now a child of God. I want to be emphatically clear because I think people are always confused about this every time I preach on it, so let me be clear one more time. You, sir or ma'am, were not born a child of God. You were born a child of your parents. But you and I, me, let's just talk about me. Let's not make you feel bad. Let's, Let's talk about me. I was born alienated from God. I was born an enemy of God. 
And I did not become a child of God until the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. And through His conviction, I was able to call upon the name of Jesus and ask Christ to become the Lord of my life. And it was upon placing faith in Jesus Christ and only then that God took me from an enemy and adopted me into His family. And now I'm a child of God. And if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you weren't born a child of God. But the New Testament is very clear. You have now been adopted into the family of God. So that God is no longer simply just your creator. God is your father. And what do fathers do? They provide for their kids. They protect their kids they love their kids. The Father in heaven says, you are my child and I've got every single hair on the top of your head numbered. You say, Pastor, that doesn't help me because I'm bald. <laughs> well, God knows how many hairs used to be there. Amen. <laughs> he loves you. And by the way, He loves you enough to correct you when you step out of line. You ever correct your kids when they got out of line? You know what the Bible says? My son, Hebrews 12, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by the Lord. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, that is, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Today you and I ought to say thank you Lord Jesus for every lesson you've ever shown me, every truth you've ever revealed to me. And Lord, even for the hard lessons and the rebukes and the corrections you've had to give me. Because Lord, by your loving correction, you've helped me to become more like you. Number five and finally. Jesus remembers the Father's hope. He remembers and He reminds us of a Father's hope in verse 39. What does He take, say to the Jewish people? You people, you shall see Me no more until you say, Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Now what in the world is Jesus talking about here? Jesus is not just leaving them with the bad news. Jesus is really leaving them with the good news. Now Jesus said this news to them as something of a rebuke, no doubt. But what time is Jesus looking forward to right here? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's looking forward to the day and the time where Jesus one of these days is going to come all the way back to this earth and he's going to establish his kingdom on the earth. And when that day comes, the Bible says his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And the Bible says in that day the lion will lay down with the lamb and the child will play by the cobra's hole and not be harmed because there will be no harm and devastation and chaos in all of the world because Jesus Christ is going to be reigning. See, the Jewish people, sadly, many of them, at the first coming of Christ, rejected Jesus. But, by the way, many of them received Him. And did you know that of this book that I'm holding in my hands, it was written predominantly by Jewish writers. You know that our Savior Jesus was Jewish. You know that all of His disciples were Jewish. And it was the Jews who were first saved and took this gospel to the nations. Thanks be to God, the Bible says in Romans 11, you and I have been grafted into their heritage and into their faith. But in mass, a good number of the Jews didn't receive Jesus. And unfortunately, sadly, you know, I was invited the other day and my wife and I went. We couldn't stay long, but we stayed as long as we could the other day. We were invited to come to a menorah lighting at World's Fair Park. And we thought, what a unique opportunity that these Jewish people in our community would allow us to come and be among them and just to try and get to know them and to meet them. And, and the hope that we have in that is that somehow ultimately we'll be able to help them understand that Jesus, Yeshua, is their Messiah. They would say Mashiach. We hope and we pray that through those relationships we'll be able to help some of them understand that the Savior that you say you're looking for has come and His name is Jesus. But many of them as of yet still do not understand. But guess what? One of these days at the end of time, the Apostle Paul has prophesied something spectacular. 
Romans, rather, Romans chapter 11, verse 26. You know what the Bible says there? At the end of time, all Israel will be saved. All of Israel, whatever is left of Israel at the end of time when Jesus Christ comes to make all things new, the entire nation, all of them, 144,000 in the tribulation are going to declare the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that time comes, what will the Jews say? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Just like a loving father, in the midst of difficulty, sometimes our fathers have to remind us of the good times, right? Any of you that are dads know if you've got boys, we've got to teach our boys to work, amen? Y'all still with me out there? And I'm not sure that we've done a great job teaching our boys to work. Are you with me? Because it seems like everybody's hiring right now. Have we taught our kids to work? Now listen. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he won't eat. That was the rules in the early church. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. God made us to work and we ought to teach our kids to work. And and I've been blessed to try and teach my boys to work. And sometimes what you have to do when you're out there, you're working, you're in the yard, you're somewhere, you're moving stuff. And and like we did when we were kids and like we still do as adults, we get weary and we get tired and we start looking at the clock and saying, is this almost over? (laughs) So what do you have to do to your kids? Sometimes you say to them, look, if you'll just hang in here with me a little bit longer, You stay with me and work a little bit longer. I promise you here in a little bit, I'll take you and we'll get something really good to eat. Or you hang out here with me a little bit longer and I promise you we'll take a fun trip later on today, but we got to work right now. There's work to be done. But if we do the work, something really good's coming later. The Lord Jesus, like a loving Father, as we're living this Christian life and the Christian life ain't easy. It's not easy. But he reminds us every step of the way. I know it's hard right now. I know you feel alone. I know you feel persecuted. I know you feel depressed. I know this world's not your home. But Jesus says to you, there's something much better in store for you. I have laid up a place for you in heaven. So don't grow weary in well-doing. Keep on going because I've got something great prepared for you in the hereafter. Jesus reminds us every step of the journey. That he's got an amazing reward prepared for the children of God laid up in heaven. All I want to say to you as I close this morning is that it's only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that you and I can become the sons and daughters of God. That's exactly what I was trying to express to you earlier. Today, if you want to be adopted into God's family, you can do that. And in fact, the greatest way that you can celebrate Christmas this year is if you've never been adopted by God, you've never trusted in Christ, you can do that today. Celebrate Christmas the best way by being adopted into the family of God. And I don't care who you are and I don't care where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. God the Father says to you today, I want you to be my child. You come and you receive my grace. Many of us here today would say, well, pastor, I've done that. Thanks be to God years ago. I settled that. I placed my faith in Jesus. God adopted me into his family. Well, that's wonderful. Don't you and I who have been adopted by the heavenly father, let me just ask you, when your dad was alive, didn't you want want to make your dad happy? Some of you have dads that are still alive. You want to put a smile on your dad's face, right? Don't you want to put a smile on the face of your heavenly father? with the way that you live your life down here? I want to give you this verse and I want to pray. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10 says this, The joy of the Lord is your strength. You know what I take that to mean? That when you and I are living holy unto the Lord, and we're trying to live submitted to Christ, God looks down on our life and He smiles down on our life. And when you know you've got the favor of God on your life because you're doing everything that you can to live empowered by the Holy Spirit and submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you know in your heart of hearts that you're living in a manner that's pleasing to God, what does it do? It strengthens you from the inside and gives you the power that you need to continue to press on for the Lord Jesus. Let's live our lives in a manner that we put a smile on the face of God during this Christmas season and always.